God, we thank you, Father God, for blessing us to come to the house for worship one more time. We thank you, Lord, that you are blessing us, Father God, to hear from you. We ask you, Father God, to forgive us for our sins, bless our lives, and bless us, Father God, that we will honor you in all that we do. Bless your word on tonight. Bless your word to fall on good soil. And bless your word, Father God, to empower us. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Yes. So many people doubt you. I can't live without you. That is why I love you so. He's so real to me. Hallelujah. The God that we serve ought to be real to you. He's real to me. Is he real to you? Is he real to you? Because the fact of the matter is, if he's not real to you, you better make sure you get to a point where he becomes real to you. Amen. You think it's hot out here today? My, my, my. You think it's heated today? Just make sure that God is real to you because it's really hot out there. And this does not compare to those who will, will not make it to heaven. Amen. This temperature, or even at a 113 index. Ooh, good God Almighty. Don't worry about the temperature. Just look at what it feels like. It is it's hot out here. It's hot out here. I'm telling you, it's hot out here. Amen. We are in Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. I think we closed out with verse number 9 last week. We're going to look at verses 10 through 19 this week. Amen. So uh, we're talking about uh, Saul. Uh, tell me some things about Saul. We're talking about Saul. What, what do we know about Saul? He's what? We don't know that yet. Amen. 
Y'all, y'all good Christians trying to get ahead of the scripture. We don't know his name changed yet, do we? We're just in Psalms, verse chapter 9, verse 1, through verse 10, verse 9 so far. And so we're on verse 10 tonight. He's still, his name is still Saul, right? He's still Saul. He, he's Saul. Tell me about Saul, not Paul. Tell me about Saul. Persecuting Christians, anybody else? What else do we know about Saul? Saul held the coats of the men at the stoning of Stephen. Okay, he held the coats of the men. What does it mean to, to hold the coats when somebody is doing something wrong? What does that mean? You're in agreement with it. So if he didn't kill anybody, he didn't stone Stephen, then why is he held? Held as one who was guilty of it. Anybody? Why? Why? Why would you? Why would you hold me guilty if I didn't do it? We got a brother now being indicted for the third. Not a brother. We got a man now being indicted for the third time. He said he didn't do it when all the world saw him did. And then there are some people that say they never entered into the capital. But they held their coats. So, uh, one thing that that the um, the chief of police said in Minnesota, and that is, in your silence, you are complicit. What does that mean? If you're silent, you are complicit. Just as guilty. What else does that mean? In your silence. Okay, if you're not objecting to it, then you're going along with it, right? So we have people all over the world every day that's um, complicit. They 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 don't they don't object to it. They don't say anything. And uh, the word was out even even before it was said out loud. The word was already out. If you see some, do some. If you see some, say something. If you see some, move away from it. Don't support it. Don't be a part of that which is wrong. So we found out tonight, we found out before tonight, that Saul was complicit. Saul was in agreement. Saul was in agreement. And then we found out last week that he was really in agreement because he was breathing threatenings. He was still going on with it. Stephen dead and gone. And Saul still pulling folk out of the church, out of the synagogue. Kill him. Brother Miles, why was he doing that? You told us last week he was doing it because of what? Because he felt like Christianity was an offense to God. Right. So he's trying to he's trying to defend God's case. He's trying to defend God, right? And, and Peter says we ought to be ready to give an answer of everything that lies within us when it comes to the Lord. We ought to be ready to give an answer. But Paul was unknowingly wrong. He meant well. He was trying to do the right thing. But he was wrong. Have you ever tried to do the right thing and was just dead wrong? And you didn't find out you were wrong until later on? I have. I have. And you know what? Just because one has passion about it doesn't make you any right. Passionate. I mean, people have passion about things. They they they're enthusiastic about it, but they are just as wrong, even though they have enthusiasm. So Saul, verse one says, Saul is still breathing threatenings. He's still threatening. He's still breathing threats, and he's still murdering the disciples. Who are the disciples here? Disciples. What, what, what are you talking about, Wayne? And this is going to be this is going to be be good to know later on. Disciples are those where who are those who are disciples? Those who are following the way, following God. Following God, following the way. That was going to be my next question, though. Disciples. What does the word disciple mean? Um, 
Does the word disciple mean anything? It means pupil. What does the word pupil mean? That's a big word. You know, I went to school. I went to public school. You know how they messing public schools up right now. Right? I think we had a good thing before they started messing it up. So when you look at the word disciple, in verse in chapter 8, I think it was, we started talking about Christians being found in the way. Then it carries over to, to chapter 9, people being found in the way. Not in the way, but of the way. Not in the way of something, but in the midst of the way. The way is, is talking about those who found in the Christian way. So notice this. The scripture identifies in the book of Acts, those who are Christians, number one, they were called disciples. Number two, they were called believers. And number three, those who belong in the way. Those who were belonging of the way. So they were recognized three ways. As disciples, as believers, and those of the way. Of the Christian way. This new thought religion is on the scene. The way. Now, when we get down through these verses, I want you to tell me what is the fourth name by which Christians were called? Because I know you read the whole chapter. You can tell me now, but let's just wait till we get there. I know you prepared for Bible study. You're a good pupil, good student, good disciple. Verse number 10. Now there was a certain disciple. Now, let me back up. There was a certain disciple named Ananias, but we had to set the scene up before we get there or not. What happened to Saul? He was on his way to Damascus and something happened. What happened to Saul? Anybody? Light shone from heaven. He was thrown to the ground. Light shone from heaven. He was thrown to the ground. Was he knocked from his beat? <laughs> we preach it. We teach it, right? That a light shone from heaven. And Saul was knocked from his beast and he was hit in the ground. Okay, there are reasons to believe that he was knocked from his beast. But the Bible says he was thrown to the ground. So we don't know whether he was walking. We don't know if he was on a beast. We don't know if he was running. We don't know if he was jogging. But one thing we know, he was on the ground. Light shone from heaven. What else happened? There was a voice that spoke. What did the voice say? Or ask? Or do? Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What was Saul's reply? Who are you, Lord? Who are you? And then he follows up with Lord. You know in the Bible, folk are always asking questions they already know the answer to. Even in the 21st century, people are asking questions they already know answers to. Yes? You ever ask a question, you just want to see what the answer is going to be? Why y'all do that? Why, why do people ask questions they already know answers to? See what the person is going to say. You don't trust that person or something? They just answer different. Mm. So Saul is not to the ground he hears a voice. Does anybody else hear the voice? Uh, this is a trick question, isn't it? Does anybody else hear the voice? Yes. Yes. Who heard the voice? The other men who were with Name him. Name them. No names. Oh, okay. The other men who were with him. So where were these, why were these men with him? They were going to help him do what he was going to do. They were going to help him do what he was going to do. What was he going to do? Bringing them to Jerusalem. He was binding them. He was dragging them out. Did he just drag men out? Men and women. He, he was no respecter of person. He did not discriminate. You know, when the devil is in on the move, he does not discriminate. You, you would think that the devil would not harm little children and little babies. You would think, wouldn't you? 
You would think that, that they would have pity and mercy on little babies. But I noticed, I noticed something when, when you look at dogs, especially pit bulls, they always go after the person that's most vulnerable. Pit bulls got this bad habit of, of grabbing individuals around their throat and locking in and shaking their head until they're dead. Brother James Beard, next door neighbor here at the church, he's next door to the church, he has horses and, and he used to have a lot of different animals. One day between Sunday school and, and church service, he came through the gate with his horse. He said, call the police, call the police. This dog is trying to kill my horse. Call the police. He was running and the horse was weakened. Pit bull running right behind the horse. And if you look at the horse, there was a big old plug bit out of his neck. Pit bull had jumped up on the horse neck and pulled the plug out of his neck. Trying to do his thing of grabbing individuals or things by the throat and killing them. He pulled a big old plug about three inches round out of his horse neck. But Beard was calling and he was saying, hey, call the police. Dog trying to kill my horse, trying to kill my horse. So he's riding the horse trying to get away from the pit bull. And this pit bull had his mind made up. He didn't come after any individuals. He didn't come after people. He had his mind made up. He's going to kill this horse. And so he ran after the horse, and the horse was riding, uh, the rider was riding the horse, and he got right out in the field behind the church, and he latched on to the horse stomach. And he clapped down on that horse stomach. And the horse is running, and the dog is latched on. The dog is flying through the air. This is no art avatar I'm talking about. This is right here at 4251 Chiromar Road. Call the police, they showed up. By the time we got out of church, <laughs> hours after it was over, they showed up. He comes out here riding and says, well, where's that dog? I said, well, you better be careful. That dog may charge. He said, well, I got something for him. I'm saying, where were you hours ago? I guess when I was talking to the lady on 911, she couldn't believe it. She, she asked me three, four times, you said what now? But the devil will always try to kill the most vulnerable being. The devil will always attack in a place where you cannot defend yourself. We were riding bikes and one of the guys decided to take his granddaughter with her. So he set her on the, on the bike, on the front of the bike with a pillow and she was sitting sideways and we were riding on the trail and a man was walking with two dogs, one huge dog and, and one uh, small dog. And the dog, the big dog, when we got about 20 feet away, the big dog broke the leash and went right after that baby on that bike. All of us riding, but he, he zeroed in on the baby, a five-year-old, and that dog was out to kill. What does the devil do? He's out to kill, to steal, and destroy. Saw, saw being used by the devil, thinking he's using by God, being used by God. He's pulling people out. He's still threatening. He, he got permission. To go and kill Christians. Jesus says, Saul, Saul, why you why you keep kicking against the brick? Why are you going through this useless exercise? This phrase, kicking against the prick, or kissing, kicking, kicking against the, the provoking, the kicking against means that you're doing an exercise that's meaningless. I mean, just going through the exercise. Verse 6, chapter 9 says that so he trembling and astonishing 
said, Lord, what would you have for me to do? He asked the question, who are you? He asked the question, what do you want me to do? And at the same time, guess what? He's submitting to the Lord. When a man, woman, boy, girl come in contact with Jesus, they can never, ever, ever be the same. When one surrenders unto Jesus, they have to change. In the men who journeyed with him, stood speechless. Verse 7. Then Saul arose from the what? From the ground. He arose from the ground. When his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Why didn't he see somebody? He was blind. And he was three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor drink. He did not eat anything. He did not drink anything. Some theologians say that, that Saul was fasting because he had met God. Other theologians say he was blinded because he has been blinded by this bright light. But for three days, he didn't eat anything. And for three days, he didn't see anything. The first thing, not eating anything for three days will have killed some of us. I mean, flat out. Been, we've been dead on rock. He didn't eat anything, didn't see anything, didn't drink anything for three days. Verse number 10, where we are tonight. So there was a certain disciple at the master's name, Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here am I, Lord. Now, a lot of people have dreams and visions and the Lord speaks to them and then they come to me for me to interpret it. I don't have dreams and visions like that. I have not been given the, the, the gift of interpretation of dreams and visions. There are a lot of people who can tell you point blank every step of the way and they can be right about it. And when we look throughout the Bible, we see dreams and visions taking place all over, and these people are really, really, really hearing from the Lord. The problem I have is people saying they hear from the Lord in the 21st century, and I know they haven't heard from the Lord. Brother Whitlock, why I know they haven't heard from the Lord? Because I know you know me, Brother Whitlock. How do, how do I know that they have not heard from the Lord? That's right. If, it, if it's from the Lord, it's going to come to pass. Now the Lord does repent. The Lord does recant. The Lord does change his mind. But when the Lord changes his mind, he changes it for the better, not for a lie. Somebody help me. So the Lord, the Lord has a way of blessing us and he does speak to people through visions and dreams. He just doesn't do me like that. I mean, when I dream, or I dream, sometimes it's a nightmare. I dreamed about snakes one night. Let me tell y'all, it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. I mean, it was horrible. It's something that you don't even, you want to wake up and you can't wake up. Some people, why, why do wake dreaming and have a nightmare? So he, he dreams, and I see this vision, and when he sees this vision, he's talking to the Lord, and he says, Lord, here am I. I hear you, Lord. Where have we heard that before? Where have we heard, Lord, here am I. Lord, I'm here. Lord, I'm available. Where have we heard that before in Scripture? Anywhere? Anywhere? Yes, ma'am. I can't think of his name. Isaiah. Isaiah, right? 
Isaiah chapter 6, we see Isaiah. The Bible says it was in the year that King Uzziah died that Isaiah also saw the Lord. He saw him like never before. He saw him high and lifted up and some things took place when he saw the Lord. His train filled the temple. The glory of the Lord was present. And when he saw the Lord, he said, Lord, speak to me. Lord, hear am I. Use me. But he didn't say it until the, the Bible says that he saw himself after he saw the Lord. Let me tell you, when you get to a point that you want to compare yourself to somebody, compare yourself with the Lord, and you will see how unholy you really are. God is holy and we are unholy. Isaiah said, when I saw the Lord, I saw the Lord like never before. And I said, woe is me. I am undone. I'm unclean. I'm messed up. But see, if you compare yourself to me, you're probably doing a lot better than I am. When you come to your Christian walk, you may be doing good. But when you compare yourself to the Lord, you have to come to the conclusion, I am undone. And then Isaiah says this. He says, and I looked at the, the guys around me, and they messed up too. Job's friends. Job's friends would tell Job, Job, go on, confess your sin, man. We know you messed up. Walk around here thinking you are, are the best person in the land of all. Walk around here thinking that you got caught blocks with God. Walk around here thinking about you are holy. Well, I, I, I got some friends. I used to have some friends like Joe. When you're down, they'll kick you. We have to understand when God calls us, we have to make ourselves available to him. And now it says, hear my Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight Street. Go to Straight Street and inquire at the house of Judah for one called Saul of Tarshish. And behold, he's there praying. Verse number 11. He says, Go on Straight Street. See, and I didn't have a problem with going down Straight Street because Straight Street was one of the two parallel streets that run straight to the city, through the city. It went from, from one end of the city to the other end of the city. It was called Straight Street. Boy, I've heard some preachers preach that about Straight Street. Oh, I went to the street. Called Straight Street. So that he, he, he goes, he tells, God tells him, go to the house of Judah. Judas. One is there named Saul, and Saul is praying. Now, the word has gotten around about Saul. What do you think Elanai said to God? Let's see. Verse number 12. And in a vision he has seen a man called Ananias, named Ananias, coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive sight. Look what God does. God prepares the patient and he prepares the, the paramedic. God prepares the patient and he prepares the nurse. God prepares us for the right thing at the right time. What has God prepared you? For what has God prepared you? Has he prepared you for such a time like this? Well, we heard that statement before. God has called you for such a time like this. Well, we heard that statement. Women ought to know this one. Well, we had that statement. Esther. That statement. Esther. Esther, right? Mordecai says to Esther, don't you think you may get away because you're in the king's house now? Because you wear royal clothes. Because you are the queen. You still one of us. And if we get killed, you get killed. God may have prepared you for such a time as this. God prepares the atmosphere and he prepares the people that we will meet. He prepares us. So God is preparing Ananias. And not only is he preparing Ananias, he's also preparing Saul. 
So God speaks to both of them. Don't raise your hand, but just think about it. How many of you have been told that the Lord told me you're going to be my husband or be my wife? Two, three people sneak at that time. The Lord told me that you're going to be my husband or be my wife. The next time you hear that, you make sure that the Lord has told you what the Lord has told him or her. God is so intelligent that he prepares both parties. He prepares. It's not his, his yoke is easy. His burden is light. He knows how to prepare us even in the midst of trouble and trauma. God prepares us even in the midst of our loved ones transitioning. God has a way of preparing us. In the midst of one person coming to heal another one, as it is in the text, God will prepare you for it. We just have to hear him, listen to him. God prepares Saul, he prepares Ananias. Then Ananias answered, verse number 13, then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. That's what I'm trying to get to. I have heard from many about this man how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. How much harm he's done to who? Saints. Somebody should have hollered right there. Why somebody should have hollered? Remember we said we were going to look for the fourth name that Christians are given Oh, y'all missed it. You missed your shout right there. They were called disciples. They were called believers. They were called Christians. They were called those who belonging in the way. So in verse number 16 of Acts chapter 9 is the first time they are called saints. The very first time. That's why we call each other saints. Yes? Somebody says, I ain't seen no saints around here. They don't look like saints. They act like saints right here. So for the first time, they are called saints in Acts chapter 9, verse number 13. This word saints suggests that we are set apart. We are different. We, we are set apart. We are so different until God has blessed us to be separated from the world. So they are called saints. Verse 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from so many people. I mean, folk talk about this on the grapevine. People talk about this. The word on the street is Saul is a bad man. Saul is a bad man. And Saul would probably walk around saying, I'm a bad man. Where have we heard that before? I'm a bad man. I'm still pretty. Boy, y'all look like y'all act like y'all on rhythm today or something. I'm a bad man, but I'm still pretty. Class is clay. I'm a bad man. I'm a bad man, but I'm still pretty. So Saul walks around arresting Christians, and the word has gotten out that Saul is a bad man. And now it goes on in verse number 14 and talk about how he had the authority from the high priest. And here he has authority from the chief priest. To bind all who called on your name. Now we see Christians as those who call on the name of the Lord. So we have Christians who are called believers. We have Christians who are called disciples. We have Christians who are called those in the way. We have Christians who are called saints. And now we see Christians who call on the name of the Lord. So these saints, these disciples, those in the way, these believers call on the name of the Lord. We ought to be willing to call on the name of the Lord. 
It ought to be a part of our daily practice to call on the name of the Lord. Anybody in the room calling on him on a regular basis? Don't let people tell you that trash talking about the angels in heaven get tired of you calling on the Lord. Don't let people fool you. The angels in heaven do not disobey God like we disobey him. They don't mean argue with God like we, we argue with him. God said move, the angel moves on your behalf. He moves when you call on him. The Bible says these Christians, these believers, these disciples, these who are found in the way, these saints called on God's name. And I said, oh, man, he has been taking folk out. He has authority from the chief priests to find everybody who called on your name. Verse 15. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. Can you believe that? God uses a rascal like you. Isn't that something? Just think back. Just look over the shoulder of your life and think about where God has brought you. How far he's brought you. God says to Elanai, Elanai, don't fear. Don't worry about it. The Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. God can take a messed up man. God can take a murderer. God can take a known criminal. God can take a terrorist and make him a vessel for him. Back in the 80s, uh, probably the late 80s, we went to the prison ministry. Pastor Manson Johnson preached this sermon. He, he talked about God changing a bad man. God can change a bad man. I'm a living witness. I preached for 12 years at the Star of Hope, for 12 years. Even before I was preaching, I was teaching at the Star of Hope. For 12 consecutive years, there would be a guy sitting in the back. He never came up for altar call. He never shook my hand afterward. He never asked me to pray for him. For 12 years, he sat in the same seat. He never smiled. He never said amen. Until one day after 12 years, after I preached the same gospel, every time I went, one day he came down the aisle after church was over. Tears streaming down his face. He said, man, I got to confess. I've been mad at you for 12 years. He said, matter of fact, I got sick and tired of you talking about Jesus. And you did it consistently for 12 years. Matter of fact, I've been trying to get you by yourself. So I could kill you because I got sick and tired of you talking about Jesus. He said, but tonight, my heart has been changed. Tonight, I can no longer kick against the prayer. He said, man, I love you. He started hugging me. Man, I love you. Will you please forgive me? I even plotted to kill you. But every time you left, somebody was always with you. I was looking for a way to kill you. But the Lord arrested his attention. The Lord arrested his heart. And so now I stand tonight to testify of God's goodness. Let me tell you, God keeps us through dangers seen and dangers unseen. And some people don't have any reason to live, so they don't mind taking you out. One of the worst things you can see is somebody choosing to kill somebody before they take themselves out. If you want to get out of here, go on. Leave me alone. And they take their children out, their, their family members out. They take their grandparents out. And the grandparent is the only one that will put up with them, that, that will let them stay at their house. And they take their grandparents out. We have to understand that God 
wants to use us as a vessel for him. As vessels for him. He says, he says, he's my chosen vessel. He's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles, before the kings, before the children of Israel. He says, I've already chosen Paul. And Paul is going to bear my name. He is going to teach for me. He's going to preach for me before the kings, before the Gentiles, before the Jews, before those who are the children of Israel. He's going to bear my, he's going to call on me just like you're calling on me. And not only is he going to call on me, he is going to teach and preach for me. He is my chosen vessel. You know, that's the good thing about when God changes a man or a woman. If they weren't scared in the streets, they're not scared on this side either. God delivered me from Christians who have gotten to a point where they are so scared to even tell the story of Jesus Christ. Go bring the dope dealers. Go bring the, the robbers. Go bring the murderers. Bring them on here so we can go out there and reach some people for Christ. When, when Saul gets saved, Saul becomes just as enthusiastic about winning souls as he was about winning souls on the other side. He was serious about it then, and he's serious about it when he comes to the Lord. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now he brings Saul in. He brings him in. And he's already come to. God brings Saul in. And he already come to the conclusion. That Saul will have to suffer some things. Why he got to suffer? He gave his life to Christ. Have you been told before. That uh, come to Jesus. In all your troubles. Will be over. Is that your testimony? I came to Jesus as I was. I was weary, wounded, and sad. I found in him a resting place. Now he has made me glad. All of that is true. But when you come to Jesus, some things can still go wrong in your life. When you come to Jesus, some things that you've done then, you got to pay for it now. Some things you just got to pay for. Some things just you got to deal with. And some things we bring it on ourselves. Saul brought it on himself. He, they brought, he brought it on himself in the fact that folk still have a memory. How many of you have used that statement before? I will forgive and I will forget. And then somebody else used a statement, I will forgive, but I ain't going to forget. Anybody? I forgave him, but I ain't forgot. People remember who you were. God even remember. God throws your sins into a sea of forgiveness, but there's a natural course that must take place. You can go around mistreating people all you want to and, and acting crazy all you want to and then you can come to Jesus. Yes, that's good. Always rely on that, that statement that my brother-in-law says when he was with, with, the, um, with the Harris County uh, juvenile system. When the boys found out that he was a preacher, all of them met Jesus. All of them, all of them came in there. Uh, Reverend Williams, Reverend Williams, uh, Mr. Mr. Williams, uh, Reverend Williams. You know, they'll slip up and say Reverend Williams so he knows where they're headed with it. Reverend, Reverend Williams, I, I got saved. I, I'm going to heaven. He said, yeah, that means you won't go to hell. But you going to jail. People will always think that things are wiped away and they will. All of your sins have been wiped away but there's a natural process that has to take place and we gotta pay for what we did. Isn't that something? Does that sound contradictory to you? We gotta pay for it. 
The Bible says, every idle word will be brought to the judgment. Every idle word. God knows our thoughts. He knows what we're going to do before we do it. He knows our ins and our outs. God really, really, really know us. He really knows us. And then he, God says, he going to suffer a lot of things for my sake. Isn't that something? Now you have gotten me to the point where I've surrendered. I've given my life. I'm in your hands. I'm going to heaven. I'm your chosen vessel. But even the chosen vessel got to suffer a lot of things. My, my, my. Anybody suffering anything since you've been saved? Have you been suffering things for Christ's sake? I mean, just simple stuff that we go through from day to day. There's always somebody that'll remember when. I remember when. You remember that time? Now, they may not ever forget that one time you messed up in their presence. I mean. <laughs> they may not ever forget that one single time you messed up. And they try to make you pay for it the rest of your life. Let me tell you, the good news is Jesus paid it all on Calvary. The debt that we owe, we owe it to him. Look what, what he says. He says that Saul will suffer a lot of things for my sake, for the Lord's sake. When we become Christians, we ought to suffer only for the Lord's sake. We just, we just don't do the things we used to do. We clean now. But so, well, if we don't suffer, let's suffer for the Lord's sake. Because when we suffer for the Lord's sake, then there are great rewards that follow. Don't just refuse to do things just because you refuse to do them. Refuse to do them for the Lord's sake. And then don't just omit things because you don't like it. Do it for the Lord's sake. And then don't just ignore God's voice. Suffer for the Lord's sake. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And check this out. God ain't even doing it in the dark. <laughs> Go show it to him. <laughs> You're going to see it. He said, I'm going to show it to him and he's going to see it for the Lord's sake. He's going to see what he got to suffer. Verse 17. And Adonai went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him said, Brother Saul. Why did he call him Brother Saul? Why did he go that way? Why did he go in the house? Why, why did he even have confidence that Saul would even hear him or receive him well? Why? God prepares. God prepares us. God had convicted him and convinced him. So Elanai went his way, entered into the house. Which house? He entered into a house. Whose house? Judah's house. Let me just remind you, many people in the Bible name were Judas. Somebody give me a stick an eye on the end of that name. I think just automatically. So he goes to Judah's house, and when he gets there, the Bible said he went in, he laid his hands on him, on Saul, and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, he calls him brother. What does that say to us? He's a Christian, right? He, he knows the Lord. He's given his life to God. When did he give his life to God? On the Damascus Road. God got his attention, arrested his attention. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came. So look at what he says. He paints a picture and he's right. 
it is a it is not a false prophecy. He's right. He's right because of the fact that he told him where he had been. Told him who he was talking to. And told him who talked to him. Isn't that awesome? The God we serve is such an awesome God until he can tell us who we talk to. He can tell us who talked to us. And he can tell us what we said to each other. He's an all-knowing God. He is omniscient. Omniscience. He's all-knowing. He knows everything. We think we hide stuff from God. You don't have to run from your neighbor. You don't have to run from your pastor. You don't have to run from your, your church members. Be concerned that God knows everything. It says, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, as you were coming here. He tells them the time that it takes place. He tells them the location. You're between Jerusalem and Damascus. As you were on your way, you weren't going back to Jerusalem. You were on your way to Damascus. He just lays it out because God has told him. He says, as you were coming here, Jesus talked to you. I'm talking about which Jesus I'm talking about? The same Jesus that appeared to you. You do know there were several people named Jesus, right? That's why when we address him, he is Jesus the Christ. He is Jesus Christ. He is Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus Christ. Jesus the Christ. Jesus of Nazareth. Who appeared to you on the road as you came. Has sent me that you may receive your sight. He has an appointed place appointed time with an appointed person for an appointed reason. What's your reason? Why did God save you and left somebody unsaved? Why did God save you? Just so you can go to heaven? God has a work for you. God wants to use you. God has already appointed you for the right place at the right time. With the right group of people. Who appear to you as you came this way on the road. He has sent me. And my purpose is that you receive your sight. God has a purpose for us. And our purpose is that somebody will see Jesus. That we will see him. That we will see Jesus and we will show others Jesus. That people will receive their sight. And in their sight, they need to see Jesus. And be filled with the Holy Spirit. He has a purpose. That he will see. He will be filled. What's your purpose? Did God leave you on planet Earth just so you can be here to populate the place? Jesus says to that tree, why are, you, why are you occupying the ground? Why are you breathing God's air? Why are you living on God's time? What's God's purpose for you? Everybody has a purpose. And most of us, if not all of us, have several purposes. So we see two purposes here. He went to Saul so he could have his sight. So he can receive the Holy Spirit. So not only will he see physically, he will see spiritually. God wants us to be instruments, to be catalysts for people to see. For the Holy Spirit to move. God left us on earth for something. Verse 18. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. Immediately. God can do what God wants to do immediately. He can do it whenever he wants to do it, to whom he chooses to do it, any way he chooses to do it. He's God. 
in all of us in our prayers, what do we want? We want God to do it immediately. We want God to do it sooner than quick and before right now. God, come on, do it right now. And we ought to pray like that. We ought to have faith like that. But we ought to have faith like that with everything we do. It says immediately. There fell from his eyes something like scales. If you've never fished before, fish have scales on them. And, and you straight in an in a opposing direction and the scales just pop off. Right, Brother Bob? If you if you if you if you if you rake in the same direction as the scale, what happens? <laughs> they just sit there and look at you. So you have to have some opposing motion. And when you when you oppose the scale, they come right off. Let me tell you, God has a way of opposing what's stopping us from seeing. Good God Almighty. God has a way. A blessing us. It says immediately there fell something from his eyes, something like scales. And he received his sight at once. He wasn't like the man that Jesus healed. He said, I see men who look like trees. So he had bl blurred vision. He had, he had some like 30, 40 vision. But this man Saul, Saul immediately. He received his sight. How quick? At once. And he arose and he was baptized. Let me tell you, when you meet Jesus, you ought to get baptized. When you trust Jesus, you ought to get baptized. And baptism, the word baptizo in the Greek comes from the Greek word meaning to baptize. And what that means is they used to take garments. And they go in as an orange garment, a yellow garment, and they baptize them in dark colors. And when it comes out, it's black. The shirt you have on has been has gone through baptism. What color is that? Oh Lord! What color is cotton? Well, why you got on a a, a blue and white shirt? That's made out of cotton. Why you got on a purple, green, orange blouse that's made out of cotton? It's been baptized. It's gone through the water. It's been baptized. When you're born again, when you are saved, you show forth your belief and your conviction by going through with baptism. Verse 19. And when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples in Damascus. I don't care how holy you are. I don't care how in tune with God you are. If you don't eat, you're going to be hungry. If you get hungry, you're going to be weaker. That's what fasting is all about, right? Brother Whitlock said that when we fast, it is unto the Lord. And guess what happens when you fast, Brother Whitlock? You get weak. Yeah. Now, fasting is not for you to lose weight. It is for you to spend spiritual time with the Lord. Yeah. The Bible says that when Saul saw, he got up, he ate. And he was strengthened. It takes food to strengthen us. It takes food. And, and sometimes we eat junk food. Junk food will strengthen us for a moment. But it takes solid food, good food. As they would say, something that sticks to your ribs. It strengthens us. We need to understand that when we meet Jesus, we are made different. We are made over. We are changed. And when we meet Jesus, we are strengthened. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. Somebody need to meet Jesus. I say to you tonight, you need to meet Jesus. You need 
to meet Jesus. If you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, this is your moment. You can meet him right here, right now today. Just to leave the story there. Jesus died for your sins. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. He rose from the dead. You bow your head and invite him into your life tonight. A little simple prayer we pray. But you have to trust him in your heart. Let's repeat these simple words after me. And honestly believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead. And his death and resurrection from the dead can make you different. Can get you to heaven. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We believe if you honestly pray this prayer, trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you believe, we believe that you're born again. We believe that you're going to heaven. And as Saul is mentioned in the text, you have a purpose. Get busy with your purpose. Sharing Jesus Christ. And let men, women, boys and girls know that Jesus is real. And that he gave his life as a ransom for us. Thank you for joining us here at the New Beginning Church, 4251 Sure My Road. That's 4251 Sure My Road. Sure My is spelled S-C-H-U-R-M-I-E-R. Sure My Road. Houston, Texas. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. Our zip code is 77048 USA. It is often time. It's time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. It's time to give to the Lord. You can give electronically by way of Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting God Jesus at yahoo.com is our Zelle account. Or you can mail in your gift to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to give. We thank you, Father, for money. We thank you for increase. We thank you for influence through the word and influence through your, your gifts. We ask you to bless us as we come to give. Bless every giver and bless every gift. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. A few announcements we have is we will have a drive-by school supply on Saturday, August the 12th. Drive-by school supply, what do we know where it is? Not yet. Okay, drive by school supply. Uh, we are having it um, on August the 12th. I want to remind our youth and our young people, as well as our seniors, to remember those who were hit by the tornado in Mississippi. We are giving uh, school supplies, so bring it to the church. We're giving school supplies to those who were hit by the tornado in Silver City, Mississippi. It is the county in which I grew up as a little boy in elementary school. So we want you to bring your school supplies as uh, next week or so we will be delivering to them in Mississippi. So whatever you do, we want to teach our children how to be givers. Uh, as Weedy is, is giving a school supply drive for us, we want to also give toward those in Silver City, Mississippi, who have been devastated by an awful tornado. And so we will be delivering those supplies in a week or two. Uh, so please, ma'am, please, sir, boys and girls, men and women, please come and give school supplies. 
We're having a comedy show here at the New Beginning Church. We're having a comedy show here at the New Beginning Church. That is August 12th at 6.30 p.m. August 12th at 6.30 p.m. Turning Hearts Ministry will be instituting and sponsoring a comedy show uh, here at the New Beginning Church. 6.30 p.m. on Saturday, August the 12th. Uh, it is a fundraiser to send our youth and our young people on 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 domestic missions, and so please, uh, ma'am, please, sir, come to give unto this effort. On August the 13th at 5 p.m. here at the New Beginning Church, we will have a tribute to J.R. Richard. We will have a tribute here at the New Beginning Church to J.R. Richard, uh, the great Houston Astro J.R. Richard at 5 p.m on August the 13th, August the 13th. Are there any praise reports or prayer requests? Praise reports or prayer requests? Yes, sir. Prayer requests for my job. Um, management has me doing a task at work that I'm not proficient in. And they have put me on a very rigorous schedule. So basically I'm doing a lot of overtime it's very frustrating. It's been a few, weeks, a few weeks already. So, so prayer that I do finish the task on time, you know, but, but that I also pace myself and don't get too overwhelmed with the task. Okay. We're praying for Brother Kerry Whitlock for his job, for his ability to execute, and praying for the task to be completed on time. Amen. We're praying for Brother Kevin Whitlock. Any other prayer requests or praise reports? I have um, Brother Brandon Davis, Nicole Davis' son, uh, Omar Poss. I have him on our prayer list. And also Dr. Patricia Horace. Dr. Patricia Horace suffered a, a great medical incident during church service at the Holy Trinity Church while singing in the choir this past Sunday. And she really needs your prayers. She's at the point where uh, her prayer, your prayers are, are tremendously needed. That's Dr. Patricia Harris. She's the lady who comes over from uh, the Holy Trinity Church and pass out and get us involved in all the medical activities. She's one of those sisters that come by and, and spend time with us. And she was just with us volunteering for the summer enrichment camp. And she was just so excited about being here so we want to lift Sister um, Dr. Patricia Horace, uh, Brandon Davis, Omar Poss, as well as Brother Kevin Whitlock in prayer. Father God, we thank you now, Lord. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you, Father God, for those who are on our prayer list. We pray for those who we know about, those who we don't. God, we ask you to touch as only you can. We ask you to heal, bless, and deliver. These names that we have called out, Father God, we know that you have an opportunity to bless. We know that they have an opportunity to make you look good. Lord, we ask you to bless them that they would do those things and you would do those things through them that make you look good. God, we know, Father God, that men, women, boys, and girls all around us are looking to those on this list to see how they will react under pressure, react in sickness, react in the midst of confusion. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to glorify yourself, to get the glory by healing and touching, to get the glory by lifting burdens, to get the glory by speed and accuracy. Lord, we thank you now. We glorify you now. Lord, we praise you for you are God and you are God alone. Lord, we thank you, Father God, that you can do anything, anything but fail. Lord, we thank you, Father God, that you are here for the saints. And we pray right now, Father God, that you do it immediately, that things will change, conditions will change, health will change, strength will be delivered. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to continue to bless in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for offerings. We thank you for tithe. We thank you for sacrificial gifts. We ask you to bless in Jesus' name. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling. 
Unto him the only wise and only true God. Unto him be power, be glory, in dominion, until we meet again. Let us join by saying, Amen. Amen. God bless you. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12, 32. Thank you for joining us tonight. Please join us every Wednesday night at 7.15 p.m. for Bible study. Join us on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m. for Sunday school. And then stay on and join us and come by and visit with us at 10.30 every Sunday morning for Sunday worship. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.